in this family adventure vlog, we are headed to the coast of Maine. Our first destination was to the end of Two Lights Road, which is near Two Lights State Park. At the end of this road, you can see the twin lighthouses that are located in this area. Of course, I have lots to say about the places that we visited, but I'm going to save that for a few minutes further into the video because in these initial couple of clips, I want the focus to be on the natural sounds of the coast of Maine. Oh, Hank. Hank is. Hey, don't drink it. What have we found over here? No. One way to go up there, I guess. Huh? It's one way to go up there, I guess. Oh, that's interesting. Very cute. Good job, take your time. It's like a slide when you're not climbing it. Oh, can you move, dude? Good job. Good teamwork, thanks for helping him. Good job. Good job, Colin. I was extremely intrigued by the gentleman who was doing some scuba diving in the area. I have no idea what he was looking for, but it did seem like as he was coming out of the water, he had a little bag of something. So I'm wondering if he was harvesting some kind of sea animal that he wanted to probably eat, I would assume. But it was really neat to see regardless. Now let me share a little bit about these twin lighthouses that are located in this area. At this point in the vlog, I have shown one of them, Twin Lights State Park, which is located very close to here and is our next destination in this vlog, was actually named after these twin lighthouses that are located outside of the park. 
They were built in 1828, and they were the first twin lighthouses on the coast of Maine. They are not open to the public. The eastern light is active, and it's an automated light station that's visible 17 miles at sea. The western light is no longer in operation as of 1924, and it is now a private home. One of the lighthouses was pretty visible from this end area. I could stand up on the rocks and look over the bay to it and get some good footage, which you've seen a little bit of so far. And then the other lighthouse, we really were not able to get close to at all. That's the one that is the private home. So as we were driving down a road to leave this area and go to Two Lights State Park, we just stopped on the road and I was able to take a couple of pictures and get, get a little bit of footage of that other lighthouse. But that was really as close as we could get to that one. And they don't have names other than the Twin Lighthouses. This entire area that you're seeing right now is not part of the state park. It is a very gorgeous location. We spent a good amount of time here. And when we had decided to take this trip to Twin Lights State Park, that was our focus. And as we got to the area, we realized that the Twin Lighthouses were not part of the park and that we actually were going to the left of the park instead of entering the park in order to get a little bit closer to these lighthouses. And then we uh, very spontaneously found the end of the road where all of this that you've seen is located. So know that that is available in this area without even going into the state park. There was a good bit of wildlife that we were able to see from this location. Lots of different ducks and seagulls floating along in the water. Also saw some evidence of seagulls being in the area. Those crab shells that were broken open and just lying on the rocks. And of course, there were quite a few different life forms to explore in these smaller pockets of water in the area. The kids very much enjoyed this location. They found it easy to maneuver and climb along the rocks. We brought Hank with us and he did a great job here as well. So definitely would consider this a family friendly location. I suspect that this location would be busier during the warmer months of the year, but coming in the off season allowed us to have the place almost to ourselves. We ended up spending about an hour in this location, and despite the fact that it is right on the coast and it is very breezy in this area, the temperatures were in the mid-30s on the day that we visited and the sun is clearly shining. We were pretty comfortable for that amount of time. We did wear appropriate shoes for the season and the environments we, we would be walking in, and we all wore our coats as well in order to keep ourselves comfortable. Uh, but we really enjoyed the time just taking in the scenery, the salty air, and the sunshine. <music> It is important to note that this close to the water, the rocks did start to get pretty slippery. And I think that that was due to the temperatures being only in the mid 30s. I think there was a little bit of slippery ice-ish, slush-ish formation going on on the rocks that was just causing them to be even more slippery than they would be if it was just the seaweed in the location during warmer months. So be cautious if you are going to get closer to the water during the cooler months of the year. Here's a nice close shot of the Eastern Twin Lighthouse, the one that is active at this point. As I was exploring, I just happened to sit down on the edge of a rock, was looking out at the water, deciding on what I wanted to do next, which location I really wanted to see before we left this portion and went to the state park. And I happened to notice this little guy down on the rocks and I could tell that he was behaving oddly and he was also alone, which isn't super typical so I watched him for a while was pretty convinced that he was injured in some way and I didn't want to spook him so I didn't want to call out to Brandon or the kids to come and see as it turns out Eli came over in my direction and I told him to be quiet so he was able to see 
this duck and then I sent him to get Brandon and when Brandon came over we talked about whether we should try to catch him so that we could pursue help for him and so Brandon did make an attempt to get a little bit closer and try to get a hold of him but his natural instincts kicked in and he hopped into the water to get away from us and we were able to watch him swim off and at first he wasn't looking too great he was doing some weird movements with his neck stretching his neck way up into the air and kind of lifting his torso out of the water in an unnatural way. So I do think he was experiencing some problems, but I was happy to see that he swam in the direction of shore. So I'm hoping that he went to the shore and was able to get himself into a location where he could rest and that ultimately he was okay. I don't know his outcome, unfortunately, but I'm going to tell myself that he was okay because that helps me to feel a little better. Oh no, it is hurt. Oh. Oh, it looks like he's going somewhere else. Hank. He's hurt on his neck. Hank. As Brandon tried to get a little bit closer to see if he could catch this duck, Hank just thought that it was his mission in life also to go after the duck. So I was holding Hank, also filming, up on a high rock on the edge of the coast and the rocks where I were at this point were not slippery, thank goodness, but it was still a little bit uncomfortable to be trying to hold Hank, who is very strong at this point, and also film the duck swimming off. So that's why you hear me saying his name in not the most happy tone. The structure of the rocks around here were really interesting. They had a very striated appearance, and if you got close to little bits of them, they really looked like wood chips. This looks so much like wood chips, but... It's rock. building when we first parked but we didn't pay much attention to it initially we just headed out onto the rocks and got ourselves close to the water but as we were coming back to the car it made a little bit more sense when we were able to piece together that that building is where the sound comes from that is associated with the lighthouse so I was able to read the sign that said that there were loud spontaneous noises and also that one section has something to do with lead and to stay away from it. So we didn't do anything else in that area, but uh, curiosity got the better of us and we did need to just figure out what it was and why it was there. We also observed this lobster shack restaurant in the area. It does not appear that it is open in the off season at all. I think it is just a seasonal restaurant, but it is there and it does have a nice little seating area um, around it. Anytime I see a bench that's dedicated to someone who's passed. I like to pay a little bit of attention to it, so that's why you saw some footage of that, and I also wanted to show the view if you were to sit on that bench and just honor the person that it is intended to be in remembrance of.
This is the other lighthouse, the one that is not functional and that is now a private home, and this is really as close as we were able to get to it. It does look very interesting, and I would love to be able to see it from the inside just to know what the layout is like and how it is being used, but that opportunity shall not be mine. Our second destination on this trip was Two Lights State Park. The state park was opened in 1961, and it encompasses 41 acres of rocky headlands. Standing high above the rocky coast and rolling surf, visitors have sweeping views of Casco Bay and the Atlantic Ocean. There are quite a few picnic tables, as well as some grills where you bring your own supplies to light it and that sort of thing um, in this park. And all of these tables are very close to the water's edge, so you could be enjoying sitting at them and having a meal. And there are quite a few benches that face the water as well, where you could just sit and enjoy gazing at the beautiful ocean in front of you. While some of the trails, such as this one, are not super accessible for strollers or wheelchairs, there are other ways to get to the same places, so you don't have to use these stairs to get close to the edge of the water. You can still enjoy the park and get nice and close and observe those views. Being right out on the water's edge like this is beautiful and amazing. I will note, make sure you bring layers because being this close to the water does mean that there is a strong breeze and there's not anything to slow that breeze down or get in its way. So even if you are visiting in the summer months, bring an extra layer that you could put on to keep yourself comfortable. There are some trails within the state park. They are 1.9 miles in length. They're considered easy trails. And this state park is in the town of Cape Elizabeth in Maine. Pets are also permitted here. So Hank did join us on our adventures in this area.
to public bathrooms there is also a playground area for kids and the parking lot is nice and big so it can accommodate quite a few vehicles <music> on this adventure was a repeat stop. We headed over to the Portland Headlight because it is very close to Two Lights State Park and I have come to adore this location as well as the Portland Headlight. So we wanted to just get a glimpse of it in the winter months. The last time we were here was in September, so the scene was very different. Since then, we have had a very large winter storm and that is the reason for the closed off section as well as the windows and doors that you saw that were boarded over. They suffered um, a good amount of damage during that storm and so they are in need of being fixed but that has not happened yet. By visiting in the off season we were able to have the place again not exclusively to ourselves but um, a very lesser crowd than it was when we were here in September and I was able to observe the light at the top of the Portland headlight actually on this on this visit because we were visiting so much later in the day and the sun was setting. So that was really neat to see as well. During this visit, we were able to stop at the Goddard Mansion, which we did not do the last time we visited. So this was a first for us and it was a very beautiful experience. So this mansion predates the fort and it was designed by a New York architect, Charles A. Alexander, for a local businessman named John Goddard, who was briefly a volunteer army colonel at the start of the Civil War in 1861. This uh, mansion was acquired by the army in 1900 and was used as the NCO quarters, the non-commissioned officers and sergeants, and later included an NCO club. It seriously deteriorated by the time of the town's acquisition in 1962. The interior debris was burned in a controlled fire in the 1980s and the walls were fenced off in 2009. site as well. We visited Battery Blair the last time we were at the Portland Headlight, so we did not stop there today, and instead we came to this one, which we had never visited, so this was another first for us. This is Battery Keys. It was one of the last two batteries built at the fort in 1906. The concrete battery mounted two three-inch rapid-fire guns on pedestal mounts with a protective shield, which means they fired three-inch diameter shells weighing 15 pounds with a range of four and a half miles. This small battery was designed to defend against small, fast attack boats in a point-and-shoot manner. Oh, wait, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> this tunnel thing, not really a tunnel, I guess, but it's a big, it goes straight back, then you take a right. You guys are lucky you that you can actually right it, walk like forward. That's out there. Yeah. Look, it says, look, I can't even. Like, I couldn't walk forward. I had to go. <laughs> okay, Charlie. Now. 
Battery Keys was named for a Civil War general who had been appointed to the Military Academy from Maine, Erasmus D. Keyes, who lived from 1810 to 1895, also the namesake of Camp Keyes, the Maine National Guard camp in Augusta. The battery also included a mine observation station built on the top to relay information on ship locations to the mine officers in the mining casemate on the other side of Ship Cove for firing and electrically controlled mines. Yeah, there's a light on. Battery Keys was the only fort to remain in use throughout World War II as the alert battery for the Joint Army-Navy Harbor Entrance Control Post, or HECP. At that point in time, this fort was operational 24 hours a day, and their goal was to regulate sea traffic into the harbor with the use of passwords, opening the submarine nets, and firing a shell if the procedures were not adhered to. The empty battery sits abandoned today. Seeing the sunset from the Portland headlight was a true treat and a wonderful way to end our day. I hope that you enjoyed this family adventure and I can't wait to see you in the next one. Bye.